If you could ask God any one question and you knew he would give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? What would you ask? Well, it may not be surprising, but by far, the number one questions that Americans ask is why does God allow pain and suffering in the world? Does that surprise you? Didn't surprise me. You know, if you've never asked the question, why is there suffering? Why is there pain in the world? The chances are you will when it strikes you full force or it strikes a loved one full force. And you know what? It's going to come. It's going to come. Jesus was honest. Jesus said, you're going to have suffering. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. He said, you will have suffering in this world. You will. But why? All I could do would be to look at you and give you a four-word answer. I do not know. I don't know. I don't know. I cannot stand in the shoes of God and give a complete answer to that question. I don't have the mind of God. I don't have the eyes of God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says, Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All I know now is partial and incomplete. But then... I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So if you ask me, why do individual events of pain and suffering happen? Friends, honestly, in this world, you may not get a full answer. And frankly, if, uh, you know, if you're going through something like that today, if you're going through a, an era of your life with a lot of suffering and a lot of pain, then the last thing you really need is some theological treatise on pain and suffering. Because no amount of words are going to be sufficient for you. It's always going to sound trite when you're in the middle of suffering. What you need is the very real presence of Jesus Christ in your life. But having said that, and this is equally important, even though we can't understand everything about why we suffer, there are some things that we can know. Even though suffering is not good, God can use it to accomplish good. Now, you might hear that and you say, well, no, wait a second. Hold on. Let's not, let's not skim over that. I've gone through some horrific suffering in my life. I've gone through some awful pain in my life. And honestly, I don't think that God, even God, can find any good to emerge from the suffering that I've gone through. Friends, if that's the way you feel today, let me just remind you of one thing. And that is that God is so powerful and so good that he was able to take the worst possible thing that could ever happen in the history of the universe, which is deicide, the death of the Son of the God on a cross. He was able to take the worst thing that could ever happen and turn it into the best thing that has ever happened, which is the opening of heaven to all who follow him. And so you have to say to yourself, if God can take the worst possible thing that could ever occur and turn it into the best possible thing that could ever occur, could he not take my pain and my suffering and cause good to emerge? And the answer is, of course he can. Yes, he can, and he will. He will. He he would use your suffering perhaps to draw you into a deeper and more intimate relationship with him. He may cause your suffering to point other people to salvation through Christ. He may um, use it to mold and to shape your character in ways that never could have been shaped had you not gone through that experience. There are a myriad number of ways that God can and he will cause good to emerge from your suffering if you are committed to following him. We decide, we decide whether we're going to turn bitter or turn to God for peace and courage. We make that decision. When tough times come, we're going to turn bitter or we're going to turn to God and receive peace and courage. 
We've all seen examples in our lives of how the same kind of suffering has a completely different effect on two different people. Some people became, become angry and bitter and, and turn inward because of the suffering they've gone through. And yet somebody else can go through the same kind of suffering and they come closer to God and closer to people and more loving and more tender. In other words, someone can lose a child to a drunk driver and turn inward with rage and bitterness for the rest of their life. But someone else has a child lost to a drunk driver and they go out and they start Mothers Against Drunk Driving. One philosopher said this to me. He said, Lee, I believe all suffering is at least potential good, an opportunity for good. He said, it's up to our free choice to actualize that potential. He said, not all of us benefit from suffering and learn from it because it's up to us. It's up to our free will. So we make the choice. Are we going to run away from God or are we going to run to God? So let me finish that quote that I started this message with because I only quoted part of this verse, John 16, 33. I want to put it into context now. The entire verse says this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. In other words, he offers us in the midst of our suffering the two very things we need the most. He offers us peace for the present and courage for the future. How? Because he's conquered the world. Because through his own suffering and through his death, he has deprived the world of having ultimate power over you. Suffering does not have the last word anymore. Pain does not have the last word anymore. God has the last word. Jesus is the last word. You see, God's ultimate answer to suffering is not just an explanation. It is the incarnation. Suffering is a personal problem. Therefore, God sent a personal solution in Jesus Christ. God is not some distant and disinterested deity. He, through Jesus Christ, entered into our pain, entered into our suffering. And Psalm 34, verse 18 says this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. This wise philosopher that I got to sit down with said this to me at a time in my life when I was going through some tough times. He said, Jesus is there in the lowest places of our lives. He said, are you broken? Jesus was broken like bread for you. Are you despised? Jesus was despised and rejected of men. You cry out that you can't take it anymore? Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Did someone betray you? Jesus was sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Are your tenderest relationships broken? Jesus loved and he was rejected. Do people turn from you? Well, guess what? They hid their faces from him like he was a leper. Does he descend into your deepest hells? Yes, he does. In fact, from a Nazi concentration camp, Corey Tinboom wrote these words. No matter how deep our darkness, he is deeper still. He is deeper still. Every tear we shed becomes his tear. And then the wise man said this to me. He said, it's not like God just sympathizes with you like a close friend would. Any close friend, if you're going through pain and suffering, any close friend of yours is going to sit on the couch next to you and is going to put their arms around you and is going to empathize and sympathize with you. That's true of any friend. But he said, if Jesus is in you, if you are his child, he is inside of you. And if he is inside of you, he is closer to you even than your closest friend. And therefore, your sufferings become his sufferings and your sorrow 
becomes his sorrow. And so, friends, when tragedy strikes, and it will, or when pain comes into your life, and you know it will, then you have a choice to make. Do I turn away from God and turn bitter? Or do I turn to God and find